A warning to our listeners today, this episode contains depictions of suicide and domestic violence. Listener discretion is advised. Hello everybody, this is Jules and before we begin, I would like to say a few things regarding this wonderful podcast. This is a project that I have been thinking about since 2019 and it's only now that I have managed to get it going. So I do appreciate that you're taking the time to give it a listen. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Creative Caravan that has supported me in the production of this podcast. Also, a very big thanks to each of my guests who allowed themselves to trust me with their stories and helped me in creating a space where people can feel like they can relate to one another, learn from one another, and find a sense of belonging. Enjoy! Welcome to So This Is Love. A podcast about love, the loss of love, heartbreak, and the meeting of self. We share stories on how the relationships we once had teach us about who we are and define who we become. And maybe through these stories, we can answer that age-old question. Is it better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all? So, this is love. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. Today, we are joined by Melody, not her real name, who is a 30-something female living and walking in Nairobi at the moment, and she is going to be taking us through a relationship that she had in her early 20s, um, I'd say even say late teens, um, into, her, into her mid to late 20s, and the reason we really picked this relationship for this story is because it was such a huge defining relationship for her life changing there was a lot of what we call here an aerobic character development um but right now currently she's moved on currently in a very long-term healthy relationship welcome melody thank you how do you feel being on the podcast uh, i'm happy i'm happy for you actually <laughs> i'm excited for where this podcast is gonna go i'm excited for the stories i'm gonna hear yeah i'm sure very sure i'm gonna hear um very interesting uh stories and i love hearing other people's experiences so yeah yeah in fact that's one of the biggest things that inspired this podcast is that we people talk say Nairobi is the ghetto, Nairobi is the ghetto, mm-hmm. and by ghetto they mean the dating scene yeah. is hectic. Yeah, and I really thought Nairobi is the place that is the <laughs> shittiest, shittiest of all. But uh-huh. then when you look at people from around the world who listen to what they say, they're like, oh, you can never find an authentic person in LA because mm. everyone's fake in LA, mm. or oh, you can never find love in New York. I guess each city or each I don't know maybe each place has its own thing that demonizes it exactly but yeah maybe we speak about Nairobi because that's our experience it's yeah 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 the people who live in Nairobi so all right so today Melody is going to be taking us through her story with her relationship with Kevin mm-hmm. also not his real name yeah I want us to start from the beginning tell oh me <laughs> Melody how <laughs> did you meet let me tell you I was a naive 16 year old when I met Kevin, we were in high school together. We we're in the same high school. So, um, I mean, in high school, as most of us are, when you're 16, 16, 17, you're very naive. I mean, you're very naive. What do you really know about anything? You've literally just left your mom's boob. Like, you just, you don't know anything about anything. So, anyway, that's how I would characterize myself at that age as a teenager. Um, I grew up very sheltered, so I would say even the dating scene was a very new thing for me. It was informed by um, movies, books, novels that I'd read. It wasn't really informed by anything in life um, per se. So Kevin and I met in high school. He was a year uh, above me, which was you know usually scandalous for people to date outside of their year. But um, <laughs> I remember like falling for him based on the flamboyance of of how much how much he showed me he liked me like for instance the first week he started talking to me he sat down on the ground and held onto my leg and said he wouldn't let go until I told him my name and number and I came to find out later he actually knew my name and number he just wanted it to come from me like he just wanted to like <laughs> do grand gestures and and for a 17 16 17 year old girl who is largely informed by 
romance novels and Disney, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Allah, I have met Prince Charming. This is and 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 you can imagine even like in school, your friends looking at this behavior and being like, Gosh, you know, I wish. I wish a guy would hold on to my leg until I tell him my name. The intoxication of young love. That's oh what that reminds God. me of. And he would follow me around in school. Like he would, you know, just grand gestures. Think about, now I hear it's called love bombing. <laughs> but back then, you couldn't tell me anything other than it was what I would see on La, La Mujer de Mi Vida. It was, a, it was a gesture upon gesture of of flamboyance of how much he liked me or how much he was into me. And so, yeah. Like in your box. That's how. That's literally how our story began. We, after after insisting and insisting and insi- insisting, um, I, I gave him my name. I gave him my number, and then um, yeah, we just started hanging out in school. And then he would he used to drive at the time, which was also unusual for someone to have their own car um, at in that high age school. in high school. So he used to drive, and so. After high school, he'd take me on rounds before I was I was I was picked up on weekends. I'd find ways to sneak out to be with him. Um, I remember <laughs> doing stupid things like, um, you know, my dad had paid for violin lessons. Um, so rather than go to violin lesson, well, dad would drop me off at the violin lesson place, which <laughs> was not far from his house. And so I'd just wait for dad to leave and then take a mat to his house and cut my violin classes like literally I could be a maestro today if I stuck with it but anyway (laughs) so yeah that's how our story started and I remember I distinctly remember being the envy of every one of my girlfriends in high school because this guy was very 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 good at outward gestures of (sighs) public gestures of romance so he would come to my class make out with me or come to my class and make love declarations or something. It was always something. And you see, um, for someone to, to publicly show how much they, they're into you at that age, you're just the envy of all your friends. And so I was kind of brainwashed into thinking, yeah, this is it, this is it. And you see, this was my first love. This was my first, first love. And so being very, also very much a prude at the time, I remember thinking, you know, this is going to be my husband. Because when I was thinking about sex and things like that, like intimacy, I couldn't picture being intimate with anyone other than him. In what world? <laughs> so, so, yeah, that's how our relationship began. And then um, he was a year above, above me in high school. So obviously we were thinking about what happens after high school because this is, this is someone we've decided we basically decided we're going to spend our lives together at that very young age and we don't even know how but we've we've <laughs> in this love bubble um decided that oh he's the one for me I'm the one for him kind of thing and that was it for me I had trusted the source I swallowed everything I was like this is it this is it for me and being a romantic at heart obviously he ticked all the <laughs> romantic boxes so I was like you know that kind of um, blinded me to all the red flags that were, you know, slowly creeping into the relationship, but I would ignore based on all these other gestures. What kind of red flags? So, (laughs) for instance, (laughs) um, in high school, I had a lot of male friends. Generally in life, I I, I think even even now, I, I think, yeah, I think sometimes my male friends usually outweigh my female friends. So in high school, especially, my best friend was... In, in school was a was a guy um I hang out with guys a lot, so anyway, he would go and threaten my male friends and tell them don't hang out with uh with melody if I see you with her, this is what's gonna happen um and they'd come to me and tell me, and I'd be like, nah 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 nah, like he didn't mean it that way, like you took it the wrong way, you know, um like they tried to tell me, i this is a bit much like the way he's threatening us. And me, th- me thinking it's romantic, him coming to, to check on me in class, was him coming to see who I'm sat next to. It was him coming to make sure I'm not sat next to, you know, <laughs> John or, you know, this other guy or this other guy. Like, f- for me, I ignored those, red because I was just like, oh, he cares so much. Like, every morning, he comes and checks on me, he cares so much. And I remember... Um, one time I was sat next to a guy who had made it very obvious that he liked me. And as usual, Kevin came to check up on me. He came 
he used to peep through the louvers and then enter the door. So he'd peep and I would see him peep and then he'd enter the door. This time he peeped and he gave me a look that just, it sent chills down my spine because I'd never seen a look like that before. And then he didn't come through the door. Usually he'd come through the door with either hug or kiss and, and you know, start our day. This time he, he looked and then le- left, right? And he gave me a really, really dirty look. And so I remember thinking, you know, you know the feeling of when you've done something wrong and your parents are about to come? That's, that's how I felt. And it's be- so I realized, oh, it's because, you know, this guy who really likes me was sat right next to me. Mm. Now, for me, that's not a big deal. I, I can't control who liked me or, or who didn't like me. But I remember thinking, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, I have to apologize. You know, straight into thinking I've done something wrong. And so I go look for him. Uh, and I go to his class and I find him sharing a seat with another girl. And I found that odd because I was like, but the look you just gave me, and I'm, I'm not sharing a seat with this guy. I'm li- we're, li- we're each in our seats. The look you ga- he gave me didn't match up with what he was doing. Mm. And so I had gone to apologize. But when I saw that, I was like, mm, okay, maybe I, maybe I misinterpreted it. And then I just went back to class. And I, he saw me, I saw him, and I just went back to class. And that was our first big fight. That was the first fight where his controlling nature revealed itself to me. But again, <laughs> you couldn't have told me anything about him. That fight, I remember we used to have, you know how in high school you have special rooms for special subjects. So we went into the Swahili room. And he started calling me dog and all kinds of names. Like he's like, you doggy where like in in Swahili, like really, really insulting me. And I'm just like, wait, what? Where did this come from? All because I was sat next to a guy who he knew liked me. And still I'm thinking. I need to make this right. I'm not thinking this is a red flag I need to leave, you know? And so he abused me and then withdrew from me. So whereas we used to speak multiple times a day, multiple times throughout the night, um, I remember he didn't talk to me that night, which was very, very unusual for me and very destabilizing, given by now I had gotten used to, you know, this kind of uh, constant communication. So he didn't talk to me that night, didn't say good morning the next morning, And then I was just, and I think a weekend was coming up. And so I remember thinking, okay, I have to go to his house and apologize again in person because I don't know what I've done wrong, but I I just want things to go back to normal. Did you know what you were apologizing for? I I just, all I was saying was, I'm sorry. Mm. I didn't even really know what I was apologizing for. I remember feeling hurt that he had called me names, but... I still had this, I don't know, like I just, I still had this fairy tale mentality in my head where I was just like, nah, 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 nah. Things have to stay, you know, in this bubble. Like we have to stay in this bubble. So I was like, I was apologizing, but in all honesty, I did not know what I had done wrong because I hadn't done anything wrong. Even in, in hindsight, excuse me. So I went to his house over the weekend and he was still very cold towards me. And then I apologized, I apologized, I apologized, I apologized. And then he said he has issues with trust and I have to make sure I don't break his trust. And those are the things that break his trust. And I said, but, you know, I came to your class and I saw you sitting on the same chair with someone else. I mean, what, what is it that I've done so wrong in comparison to that? And he was like, no, 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 but you see me, I haven't given you any reason to not trust me. And I said, well, neither have I. I haven't given you any reason to, not to trust me. Um, and he basically, you know, flipped it on me and said, no, 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 no. You know, if a guy likes you, you should know the intention. He, he, he he intends to do something with you. And so therefore you should be avoiding these kinds of guys. And I I mean, I think in my head, I was like, cool, cool, cool. Whatever will will keep the peace, I'll do it. So I was like, okay, you know what? I'll avoid person X person. I'll avoid them. If that makes us go back to where, uh, things were. And that's literally, the position I took from then on. I distanced myself from my male friends um, in order to keep the peace. Or I distanced myself as much as I could because obviously, you know, (laughs) you can't really avoid male friends in a mixed school. But um, yeah, so things like that. Like I, that was my first taste of extremely controlling behavior. Now, this is new behavior to me. I've never seen or experienced that before in my entire life. 
never seen it before other than when I say, you know, maybe a Spanish tele- telenovela where, you know, <laughs> the girl gets jealous and slaps the guy and then they make out and then they're, they're back together. That was my mo- my model for relationships. So I I have no idea this is a huge problem. At the same time, I really don't have anyone to give me solid advice because it's not like I could talk to my parents about it. What what business do I have dating at that age? Um, all my all my age mates kind of don't, you know, it's like the blind leading the blind. So I I just went with it. It was very confusing physiologically, emotionally. I knew, I knew at the core of me that this there's something wrong with this equation, but I just I just kept going with it based on you know but he said he loves me and I love him so and we've said we're going to spend our lives together so obviously I have to forgive this and move on yeah so <laughs> that marks the start of our relationship um as teenagers and then we went on to date for about five and a half years six years so at that point I mean I loved being loved I was addicted to the feeling of being loved and Kevin oh my god Kevin knew exactly how to make me feel loved he paid attention to me in public in private he was very very attentive very um uh, affectionate and I mean my love language is physical touch so I, I had zero zero um complaints about you know that that kind of, that's that part of our relationship i just felt like oh my goodness i love being loved i love being um the center of someone's world um on weekends like i said when i was <laughs> being a truant with my violin classes we, i would go spend time with him and we would order ch- kenchik and watch movies and and you know um fool around um at his house now his mom never it didn't live in the country so we had freedom at his house and so i remember yeah i would i would uh run away from from violin classes go and spend time with him go home wait for my mom to sleep and then sneak out again and then spend the night with him and then sneak back in and then be home on sunday like that's how intoxicating that feeling that relationship was like i just i felt like i wanted to be with him all the time i wanted to feel loved all the time i wanted to feel this you know um constant attention all the time it was you know like i said before just completely intoxicating and the pride with which he um even introduced me to his friends um or even held my hand when we walked down the street those are things i absolutely loved because remember these are things i've seen in movies these are things i've read described in novels and so i'm like oh my god he's holding my hand like in the novels you know <laughs> <laughs> young love i tell yeah. you, young love i think it's just one one for me for it it's yeah. it's, it's unrealistic it's, but it's so intoxicating it's intoxicating like you couldn't nobody and at this point you know other people like our friends my my friends in high school other people have opinions about our relationship and i'm just like unless it's positive i don't want to hear it mm. because you can't replace the intoxication i'm feeling you cannot replace it so i would do everything in my power to spend time with him everything in my power and so so what so would he by the way um so we're in this cycle of um you know uh even in even during school time uh, escaping school and going and doing things maybe going going to town and um doing our own thing then coming back like i it just felt like us against the world that's how it felt and um that's i mean i was convinced at that point that this is what it means to find a a, a husband a life partner like someone you're going to spend your life with because if this is how it is intoxicating so you know <sighs> passionate and and um uh affectionate and attentive and all these things if this is how if this is what love is then i've found it and i'm lucky you know all my friends you say i'm lucky and i'm like yeah, yeah yeah i'm lucky i've found it at such a young age can you imagine i found it at like 17 so now i i get to spend the rest of my life with you know the love of my life my gosh i'm done uh so we 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 kept dating all through high, high school and um he finished and left and went overseas and by the time he was going overseas because we'd 
we'd talked extensively about spending our lives together, the plan was for me to join him overseas. And so that wasn't hard because my parents had already uh, decided that provided I, I do well in high school, I can choose wherever I want to go and study. And provided I study a profession, I can study wherever. And so that was easy. I finished high school and then joined him overseas. Now, again, <laughs> the anticipation of us starting a life together outside of the constraints of African parents, outside of the constraints of I have to sneak to see you, I have to do, you know, I have to uh, struggle in order for us to spend time together. I was like, oh my God, now we're going to be in the same country doing whatever we want. Like, again, it was us against the world. You couldn't convince me. <laughs> you couldn't convince me otherwise. Like, I was meant to go to the UK. That was that, that was my initial tra trajectory. That's where most of my friends ended up going. Um, most of us who performed in the same way ended up going, you know, most of them ended up going to the UK. Um, me, I was just like, see you guys. <laughs> I'm going elsewhere because that's where Kevin was. So I packed my, my bags. My mom uh, accompanied me. And so we, we went off. We went overseas. And I remember thinking, I can't wait for mom to go back home. Why is she here? <laughs> <laughs> you want to start your life. I want to start my life with Kevin. <laughs> Did your so, parents know that this was your plan to join him? No, hell okay. no. They would never have let me near the airport. So um, they knew he was going overseas, but we told them he's going to a different country than, you know, to me. Because already my mom had met him once or twice and, you know, had already been like, mm, I don't know. I don't know about this this guy. But anyway, you know, at that age... All parents are haters. You're just like, you're just a hater. So according to them, he was in a different country. I was in a different country. So even when I went, um, uh, when we finally ended up uh, overseas, uh, we had to, he had to sneak and hide. And, you know, just because we were in the same accommodation, you know, we're in the same student accommodation. So he has to hide from my mom because my mom has accompanied me and will be with me for a week. So I remember thinking, my God, a week is the longest time in those circumstances, because I'm just like, when will you go back home? Why are you even here? So anyway, um, the week came and the week went and mom left. Now, I remember m mom leaving and me feeling like, oh my God, oh my God, this is it. This is now my life with Kevin begins. And um, yeah, and then our life began together. And that was the beginning of me... Um, bending and molding myself, literally turning myself into a pretzel to fit into Kevin's world. Because, uh, like I said, Kevin had already been overseas at this point for about six months before me. So he'd already, you know, made his core group of friends. He was already uh, way more settled than I am, obviously, at that point. Um, and so I'm literally coming into his world. And so I remember feeling a bit of sadness when mom left because I was like, this is, this is, you know, your parent is your, your person, whether or not you get along with, you know, they're going to have your back regard. They're going to, they're going to, you can always come home basically if your, if your parent is around. And for the first time in my life, uh, I'm in a foreign country by myself with no family member and no friend of my own. I'm now immersing myself into Kevin's world. But still, I was just like, you know what? This is what we, this is all we talked about. This is what we dreamed about. My fantasy is about to become a reality. So the first step of that fantasy was to break my lease so we could move in together because we're both in student accommodation. If you're in student accommodation, you're, you're in your own room. I'm in my own room, in my own building. And then, you know, we meet when we meet. But in terms of sleeping, you sleep in your own spaces because, you know, student accommodation is a single bed. It's not designed for, for comfort. Um, so, you know, the first step was him convincing me, you have to break your lease, you have to break your lease. And I was like, of course, of course, whatever the love of my life says, I'll do. So we started house hunting, I broke my lease. And within a few months, I've left student accommodation and I'm in, a, I'm in, in an apartment with him, a three bedroom apartment. So we had um, housemates as well. I'm like, oh my God, now I'm living the uni life, lying to my parents left, right and center because I didn't want to answer questions about why have I broken the lease? What reason would I have to break the lease? Because at this point they have no idea 
um, Kevin is 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 with me, and even if they had an idea, the fact that we're living together <laughs> would have caused them to. For to African probably. parents, that's like that's as, as good as saying oh that you've God. become a devil worshiper. Oh my God! <laughs> it would have caused them to literally, literally take a flight. Like so, I just I remember just lying and lying and lying and lying my way through life at that point to my parents. So I move in with Kevin and. Um, yeah, the the fantasy that I had in my head, <laughs> it just began to crumble around me slowly by slowly. And the this 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 fairy tale that I had built up for years, years in my mind, years listening to boys to men songs, <laughs> years <laughs> of worth of reading romance novels is just crumbling in front of me and I'm not really understanding what is going on. Now, because you see, now uh, now I've left Kenya, so obviously communication with my former friend, you know, with all my friends, my high school friends, all that was email. You know, we didn't have WhatsApp back then, so it was all email co- uh, communication. So I remember I'd sit on my laptop and, and I'm typing away, I'm probably catching up with one, one of my high school friends or probably even catching up with um, my parents, whatever. Like e- email was the, was the primary mode of communication. And then um, I remember um, Kevin going, um, actually, uh, uh, I need your password to your email. And I was like, hmm, why? He was like, well, you know, since we've decided we're spending our lives together, that was the, the disclaimer for everything. Since we've decided we're spending our life together, we don't have anything to hide from each other, right? And I was like, yeah, right. I mean, I agreed with that sentiment. But still, I was like, why? In my head, though, I was like, why do you need my password? But because I have to be this person who shows that she's a dutiful girlfriend and I'm, you know, I'm loyal as hell. I'm, I'm you know, I'm it. I'm everything. I'd be like, okay, cool. Then here's my password. Um, did not occur to me for one second that... He was asking for my password so he could go and read all my emails, all my Facebook mess. Uh, at the time, the Facebook was there, so maybe was there mess- mess- No, Messenger wasn't there, but there was was there private messaging on Facebook? I can't remember. Yeah, but there was private. There was private, private messaging. messaging, not Messenger. Yeah. Yeah. And inbox. He'd, yes, <laughs> he'd go into my Facebook inbox, things like that, and so uh, I would maybe you know meet at home after after you know he's he's had his classes in uni. I've had my classes. Come home. And there's a fight waiting to happen because, you know, why is uh, why is a guy texting? Why is a guy texting you? He misses you. Why are you talking to men? Why are you interacting with anyone from the male species? Did he and give you his password? No, I didn't even ask. You see, so uh, these are the things I'm saying. Like you, you, in in that love bubble, and without any better understanding of life. I'm just like, okay, cool. This is what a loyal girlfriend does. And he knew very well how to play on to my, my, um, my ideologies because I was a very loyal person. I was very, um, you know, very devoted. Like, if it's you, it's you. I'm devoted to you. And he knew that and he knew how to manipulate that. So, you know, he'd be like, well, if we trust each other, well, what's the problem? And I'd be like, you know, I'm not thinking, well, give me your password too. I'm just thinking, okay, cool then, because I have nothing to hide. Um, So, yeah, I'd come home from uni and there's a fight waiting to happen because why were you talking to Eric? Why why is Eric telling you he misses you? Why is... This other person telling you what what why are you talking to guys Gen- like literally why are you talking to anyone from the male species? I remember even before even before I'd I'd, I'd traveled overseas. Remember you know we were uploading pictures on Facebook of like the last day of school and and things like that. Back then everyone wanted to upload every moment of their lives. So whatever <laughs> whatever picture you get it goes up, and so <laughs> it had gotten to the point where. The threats and the, you know, because at this point, he's overseas. I'm still in Kenya. And he would email me and tell me, I saw a photo of you on Facebook with Eric. I want it deleted. Why is he, you know, why is he next to you in that photo? We're not doing it. It's maybe even a group photo that we took at a at the last barbecue we had in school. and But just because there's a guy standing next to me, there's a problem. And so I remember... Uh, guys in my class being so conscious not to stand next to me because they'd already been accustomed to this whole, eh, 
Melody has a crazy boyfriend. Just, you know, just stay away from her kind of thing. But some of them obviously were like, we don't care. Like, you know, if she's my friend, she's my friend. I'm going to sit next to her. I'm going to whatever. So just things like that. So I go overseas and, and now it's, it's mostly uh, online communication because I'm missing my friends so much. I don't have friends other than whoever he's introducing me to. I don't have friends other than um, the people we meet together. And so I'm just feeling, oh my gosh, I miss my friends so much. I'm, I'm, I'm now getting into uh, a bit of a depressive state, but I didn't even have the language at the time to know that I was, I was getting into a depressive state. I just remember feeling, I, I want my family around me. I miss my siblings. I miss my friends. I miss the lightness of life. Like life became so heavy all of a sudden. I felt like such a burden placed on me. Whereas in high school, I feel like I, I was such a lighthearted um, individual, and 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 that that's even the 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 way that my friends described me was that was that oh you know she's always laughing or she's just always like just almost like there was no issue I had, and I remember distinctly feeling a heaviness when I went overseas and started to 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 start a life with Kevin. So, um, yeah, so those fights became more frequent. Um, he's, he's, he's logged onto my Facebook. He's replied to one of my male friends and another, you know, he's deleted another male friend's email. And, and, you know, that was the cycle of my life at the time. Similarly, where, (laughs) where we were overseas, let's say we were at a party or a club and he saw either a guy looking at me or wanting to approach me. He would approach them first and hit them. What? Before they got to me, he would literally, literally hit them before they got to me. And again, I started to live this life of male people around us being very scared to come anywhere near me or socialize with me, whether in his presence or not, because this is the vibe that's being created. He's creating this vibe of don't mess with Kevin's woman. And at this point, are you still like, oh, well, you know, he's just like that because he really, really loves me? Or are you like, oh, my gosh, this is a problem? You see, I'm still in that phase of, because you have to remember, the, uh, the, 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 the love bombing was still very much in action. So, for instance, I remember one time that it was, um, Valentine's Day. He took me and all of my friends out for Valentine's Day, paid for everything, bought us flowers, bought us chocolates. So imagine telling a friend like that, that Kevin is not treating me right. It, it, it just, I would find myself almost, my voice was gone because all my friends were like, oh my God, you're so lucky. Kevin does this for you, he does this for you. Like he'd be, he'd be so flamboyant. I remember my 21st birthday, he organized a surprise party um, I, I knew no one because, uh, again, I don't have friends, but I showed up to a hotel of maybe 30 people. That you didn't know. I had no idea who they were. I do not have friends at this point. But he's organized this massive surprise party for me. He's organized a very, like those, this, those are DJ at the time, was very exclusive. Um, he's organized for him to attend and do a private DJing at my party. So you can imagine from, out, from the outside looking in, everyone is thinking, this guy loves his girl this girl is so lucky he's bought me a cake the size of this table he's bought me gifts upon gifts upon gifts and all of them have to be public they're all over the place so everyone can see them the cake is being carried by like five people that's how big it was i just remember walking into that room and i've never felt lonelier because i'm just like who are these people who are these i do not know anyone here i don't recognize anyone here this is not for me i remember thinking that i remember this is not for me this is for you but again where do I find the language to even challenge what he's doing? I'm by nature not an argumentative person. So I, was, I just used to just, okay, fine, cool, okay. So, <laughs> um, you know, it, it, things like that. So he's organized this flamboyant 21st birthday for me. Again, very much not my personality type to even <laughs> do something so big without with people I don't even know. But anyway... I went ahead with the night. Back then, I never even used to drink much. So I remember, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty sober, pretty disoriented because I'm just like, but yesterday, I remember you waking me up in the middle of the night to tell me how horrible I am. And then now, 
you're here showing everyone what an attentive person you are and so i'm literally literally um robbed of any option of talking to any confiding in anyone i only confided in my friends back in kenya because i was just like who who will believe me in this can they're all his friends he's met them they've met him first and he's what he's showing them how can i then tell them by the way when we're in, in private this all he does is abuse me and reply you know messages on my behalf and go through my message how can i explain that to people i just didn't know how so i remember <laughs> one of my sister i call her my sister now um but back then she was a, basically a stranger she attended my 21st birthday and she she was thinking this girl is so stuck up like this what, what is wrong with her like if i had a man like that I wouldn't be acting she's describing what she's observing of me cuz she's seeing me and I'm sad and I'm not talking much um and she's just like what an ungrateful b <laughs> And she's like, my God, Kevin is the, is a dream guy. Everybody wants a guy like Kevin. He's so flamboyant in public. He can talk to anybody. He's funny. He was very charismatic, very smart, and so he can engage a crowd. He's, um, you know, good looking. And then he's doing all of this. And then you want to sit there and sulk. Like I just looked like the most ungrateful human being. And she was looking at me like, oh God, like maybe I should even, you know, slide in the story and get this guy because. you know she he clearly doesn't deserve her i remember that day people also like after the party people came back to our apartment and he had also he had set up a private bar and a bartender at our apartment <laughs> and so again i find another surprise <laughs> uh when i get home and um yeah so now the party is continuing and all i want to do is sleep so i i i i think i i i said hi hi to a few people and i went to my room put my pajamas on and went in bed because I'd, i i i cannot remember a time before that when i felt so lonely and i'm surrounded by people and all i felt was what is this like what what kind of life am i living right now now at this time as well some of the people who ended up being the my closest closest friends in my inner circle are, are in this house wondering am i mentally unstable because what am i doing in the room sulking sleeping when everybody is out there having a good time he set up a private bar he's bought so many drinks nobody wants for anything like to them it's a dream come true relationship wise yeah. to me it's a nightmare and i don't know who to share it with other than people who are thousands of kilometers away So I sleep. I wake up to a house full of people because you see people slept over, you know, it's a part it's a house party so basically no one no one is in a rush to go home. This exclusive DJ also ended up sleeping at a, over at our house. I remember waking up and seeing him and being like, "Haya, kuna mzungu kwa carpet." Like <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just things that are not adding up in my like in my mind. And then I, I remember sitting down. I, I I think I made a cup of tea. and then me and my my now sister she, i i looked at her and i was like i i was thinking of going shopping today and she's like oh do you want me to take you and i was like sure and literally that's when she started to like we started talking and she was like oh oh you're nice i was like uh I, okay and she was like i didn't think you would be nice and i was like why and she starts to explain to me the perception of people looking at me from the outside looking into this relationship and seeing how miserable i look and compared to the gestures that are being done by kevin she was like i really like you like i'm you know we we had a full shopping day and i don't like shopping usually but i remember we had a full shopping day and she was like i really like you like i actually want to spend more time with you kind of thing and i remember thinking wait is this what people think of me because mm-hmm. it's such a stark difference to what people for instance thought of me in high school and i'm like so people think i'm this stuck up miserable human being and that's how i feel i feel miserable but i didn't think it was translating but what i've come to realize is my face can't hide my emotions i they <laughs> they all over my face so that started the journey of me questioning what am i doing in this relationship but at that point i'm three yeah about three years in we dated for another two and a half almost three another three years so this is this is <laughs> maybe the beginning of me really really seeing something is wrong but having zero courage to do anything about it or to even confront kevin because i'm just like 
the things you're doing are not lining up with what I believe in, with who I am, with what I want. But I was so scared of upsetting the status quo, which was already at this point messed up. But I'm just so scared because I'm just like, all I want is the fairy tale. Okay. All I want is the fairy tale, the happily ever after. So anything that threatens the happily ever after, any conflict, which by the way, you know, who who teaches us how to deal with conflict? Nobody. Um, so I'm I'm devoid of any skills of dealing with conflict. I can't stand up for myself because I'm I'm such a at this point very shy. My self esteem is at its lowest point uh, because in between the controlling and this and that, you know, he would see maybe an outfit I've worn and be like, I'm not, you know. So for instance, where we lived in uni was walking distance, and so he'd be like, I'm not walking with you to uni. You look ridiculous. And we would leave the house and he would cross the street and walk on the other side of the street from me. So during this time, you said you dated for like yeah. six or seven years mm. while you were uh, overseas. Mm. Was And it looks like the relationship even started to break down pretty early on. Mm. So was this the relationship for the entire remainder of that time? It was, I mean, it was, it had good moments in, in between. But I, I can tell you now from my recollection those good mo- good moments were so few because you have to remember now we're living together so now every day there's a problem about something and it has to do with jealousy it has to do with control it has to do with the way you're dressed is too provocative go and change and i i come from a background of my for instance my mom being so um accommodating and liberal in how i dressed i wasn't going nowhere but i could wear whatever i wanted my hair could be whatever color i wanted and that's how I grew up. So I didn't even grow up in an environment where I can say that my, 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 my upbringing was traditional and I had to wear long skirts or conservative. I could wear whatever I wanted. Um, my mom was, has, been, has always been very liberal with fashion, but I'm not going anywhere. So wear whatever you, you couldn't want. go out yeah, at night. Yeah, I couldn't go out <laughs> at night. Um, but I could, you know, I had an Avril Lavigne phase where I, I used to wear ripped T-shirts. And those were normal. For my mom, it was like, that's fine. But you stay in your bedroom or in the sitting room, or whatever, but you're not leaving the house. Mm. So for a, a, a man who's not even my relative to tell me, you can't wear that, or I'm not going to... You know, those things I used to stand firm because at least I had an example of of being uh, <laughs> having that freedom before. Maybe had I grown up in a conservative home, I'd be like, okay, okay, shit, I need to change. But because I had that freedom already, I was like, but my dad wouldn't even tell me that. Like, I'm not going to change because you don't like how my shoes look. Like, I'm not, you know, and it's not like I was dressed outrageously. It would be something like, I don't, uh, that combination of, 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 that outfit is not, I don't like the, the, the to- that top with that, uh, with those uh, pants. Um, you need to change or I won't walk with you. And I'd be like, nah, I'm not changing. And experience heartbreak when we leave the door and he literally crosses the street to walk on the other side mm-hmm. as if I'm like a diseased human being. Um, Did it ever get any worse than that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So in moments like those, not only would he not walk with me, he'd not now give me silent treatment. Now I have to apologize again. I'd gotten into this cycle of apologizing because I don't know what I've done wrong, but I'll apologize to keep the peace because I want the fairy tale. Rem- you know, and he'd always remind me, remember, we're, we're, um, we're meant to be together forever. And he would capitalize on my belief of, you know, now we've had sex, so now... Obviously, we have to to me fornicate. Mm. We have to end up together. So um, I'd go and apologize and apologize and apologize. You know, we're in the same um, university, so it wasn't hard to, to to bump into each other. So I'd go and apologize and apologize and apologize. He's giving me silent treatment. He will we will take the same bus home, but he won't talk to me. Like those are the things that I was experiencing and not realizing. Slowly by slowly, it was breaking me. And breaking me and breaking me and mo- turning me into a version of myself I didn't even recognize. So it became progressively worse, the relationship. I remember up until um, one and a half years into, into being overseas was when I was now coming back home for the first time. By that point, I had gained about 30 kilos from emotional eating. Um, I would... 
I was not much of a crier back then. I I barely barely cried. But what I would do was we had 24 hour supermarkets and again we, I lived in the city so things are in very close proximity to me. So whenever I felt sad I'd just take a walk down to the supermarket, buy blocks of chocolate packets of crisps and doritos and this and that and just go sit in front of the tv and binge and just stuff myself until i feel so full and so i've like i've stuffed myself so much i feel physically ill that's the point where i'd feel like okay enough until tomorrow and that was my cycle every single day wow and so by the time i'm coming home for the first time i've gained about 30 kilos now he was unable to come uh home at the same time so i remember thinking Ooh, I get a break. Thinking I get a break, but also in a Stockholm syndrome kind of way, being like, "Fuck, I, 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 now I don't know any life out other than him." Mm. Like, how am I gonna manage? It's I don't know how to explain it. It's just it's the weirdest thing when you're in a relationship like that. It's maybe like being kidnapped. It's 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 like okay, my captor. <laughs> has caused me grief but at the same time you don't know life without your captor anyway so i come back to kenya and i had become so big that at the airport my mom walked past me like i was walking i was walking tired with so much i was like so excited and she walked past me and then i turned and she stopped and then she looked back and she was like oh my god Oh my god. She just started saying oh my god and could not st- stop saying oh my god and then she started crying. And I'm like, "What? Like this is this is how you're going to welcome me back home because of all the weight you gained." Because of couldn't all the ga- me. yeah, all the weight I had gained. She could not recognize me. And um even now when I look back at pictures of myself back then, I'm like, "I don't blame you because the girl who left is not the one who came back." So, um she hugs me and she's crying and she's crying and she's crying and I'm just like, Why are you crying? Anyway, we go home and my brother, one of my brothers goes, "Oh, he's like g g g g g g g." If someone if someone will humble you, it's a sibling. <laughs> I remember him saying g g g g g unaka ki mama. Let me tell you, I was like, "Kwani, kwani, you know, I, I mean I knew I had gained weight, but I don't know. I maybe the reality of the extent of it had and dawned on me up until I came home to people who had seen me off. And so yeah, he 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 just he just kept saying g g g g g and I'm just like, okay. Then I go to family functions and then is when it was completely solidified for me. Now I'm a whale because I go to family functions and I remember my uncle going, "Ay ay ay, menona." And I'm just like, "Guy, okay. Is that all you see? Like because that's the first comment I'm getting everywhere I go now. It's about my weight." And I'm like, okay, gosh, how bad is it? And then I remember now see, I'm back home now I look at old pictures of myself and I'm looking at pictures of myself now like in in that current state and I was like oh, I'm massive, massive. And not only that, the the difference that made me very sad was the look in my eyes. I looked dead. I looked like someone who wasn't really alive. Um and I remember that making me very sad. But anyway, uh holidays holiday you're still going to enjoy your holiday remember that holiday now you know reconnecting with my friends again them expressing the shock about how i look but also you know we're going out i remember we did a road trip w- with my friends and things like that still kevin is monitoring my facebook because you have to remember this time we're still posting on facebook so i had become so accustomed to the fights i stopped posting pictures because i was like it's going to cause a fight so i'm not even going to post but what used to happen back then with facebook is if you take a photo of us together and you tag me it will show up on my page i don't think there was an option back then of uh of refusing a tag or refusing that kind of thing so it would automatically show up on my page so again even though i was in the one posting photos he would still see what i was getting up to which i was trying to hide because at this point i've i've kind of become accustomed to hiding things so that the fights don't happen did you ever think about changing your password i did i mean uh, when we fought and 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 things would get bad i would change my password and i'd be like you know you're not going to access my facebook anymore and then the, now the silent treatment and all of this the apologies begin then i have to give the, the new password and again the cycle continues So because again you remember we have to stay together we have to stick together and there's no secrets yeah. in marriage there's no secrets <laughs> in marriage this is my life part this is my forever Ugh. anyway so <laughs> so um 
that holiday of being away from him i remember was also a mild turning point it did it still didn't quite get me where where i needed to be to leave but it was a mild turning point for me in the sense of actually i haven't had any fight with anybody since i landed in this country because when you when you're in a relationship like that you get convinced that you're the problem so i was like okay i must be i must be i must be i must be you know thirsting for people for comments for you know and he i remember he used to encourage me to eat a lot you know he used to encourage me when even when i'd tell him ah, gosh you know you know i've noticed i've gained weight or I'm, i'm eating too much he'd be like you know you need to no eat eat you're even more beautiful when you're bigger and it's just things like those that i <laughs> look back on now and i'm just like wow this was expert level manipulation i know and he was also a young man yeah. so i'm wondering how what yeah. in the world oh man he would tell me everything from sex is better when you're bigger to like literally literally every aspect of my life was under his control in one way or another so yeah so then i remember coming when i'm now you know overseas people are too polite to tell you how fat you are So I never got those comments when I was overseas. So when I've come I've come home over obviously to Kenya there's no filters here. People will tell you exactly what they're thinking. So I've told you my mom has cried at the airport. My dad was staring at me every five minutes. I could see his eyes like <laughs> And then I remember he called a family meeting to tell me I'm I'm fat. And I I just remember thinking gosh, everyone in Kenya is saying I'm fat. That's all I keep getting. And it's not the I'm fat of like the one you know kevin was telling kevin was telling me you're fat but you're beautiful you know you're even more beautiful now that you're bigger it's not that one it was we're concerned about how big you've become that was the i'm fat that i was getting in kenya so i'm like the discrepancy here is too big like there's too many people here telling me this this one person here telling me the other thing anyway so i go through my holiday now it's time to go back overseas and i'm feeling a sad and like i'm just feeling like ugh okay I have to go back okay i've had fun with you know my male friends male people who had been so scared to hang out with me before now can hang out with me because kevin wasn't around and you know not you know not all our moments thankfully would end up on social media so we'd have moments of like purely catching up as friends you how's canada treating you how's uk treating you how's america treating you you know that kind of thing so that was pretty awesome and then now i'm in the position of having to go back overseas and obviously you know back into uh, living with kevin and and that cycle that we'd <laughs> created and uh, again i'm thinking at this point i was thinking i i'm not feeling like i love this person anymore but my self esteem was too low for me to do anything about it uh I couldn't recognize myself physically so I had lost my confidence in myself physically because I remember you know not even wanting to dress up anymore not being interested in fashion anymore not being interested in you know even keeping up with even just the most basic latest trends anymore I was just like whatever fits I'm going to wear it I remember spending a huge amount of time in ug boots whether or not I was going to a classy event or not I just you know when you lose zest for life it shows and so it manifested in how I dressed it manifested in how I spoke I was so subdued I remember um never wanting to be the center of any attention because I was like it's just going to end up in a fight if 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 I say something and a guy there laughs quisha it's a fight so i just remember thinking let me just shrink myself that's the only way to keep this peace and you know we are we're meant to be together so i'm loyal i'm supposed to i'm supposed to hold my man down i'm supposed to um forgive 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 you know all these things that you're taught either in christianity or in this or in that had been so wired into my brain so i'm just like okay cool um i'm going to do everything in my power to not cause anything to be a fight so if it's male relationships mm if it's male friends mm go through kevin if you want to talk to me go through kevin if you're a man that's how <laughs> things were for the longest time until one point i got so fed up and i was like you know what i want your password too because uh, how come you 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 this whole thing of trust is one way Um I've never ever stepped outside of this relationship um or anything like that. So how come 
then I get to pay. I, I'm paying for something I've never done. So I was like, I want your passwords too. And so I got his passwords. And that for me was the beginning of, I guess, me spiraling into a depression, a, the deepest depression I've ever experienced because um, I got his passwords and I started to go through his emails and his Facebook inbox and the things I found in there. <laughs> I just remember the magnitude of it. I remember it's not just one girl he's flirting with. It's not just one girl he, I don't know, he met at a party and I don't know they did what. It's multiple girls, multiple and he's not just doing that with people who are overseas where we are, but in Kenya too. He's promising people in Kenya how he's going to come back and they're going to do this and they're going to do that and they're going to have the wildest sex ever. And nee, 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 nee. And I'm just there thinking, first of all, there's so many spelling mistakes in your fucking email. <laughs> <laughs> and he's an idiot. He didn't think to delete these things. <laughs> Secondly... I'm like, what am I dealing with? Then now I start to, now I was like, this is why you you cannot trust me because you're, you're so far from trustworthy. Like I was, when I tell you I was flabbergasted, I, I was flabbergasted because I was like, where do I start? There's <laughs> numerous people. Some I've heard of, some I've never heard of. Some, So I'm just like, do I start an argument about Mary or do I start about Catherine or do, where do I start? So I remember being like, fuck this. So then I go and change all my passwords. And I was like, from this day on, forget about my passwords. And every single guy that he had disconnected me from, I reconnected with. So I went back and I was like, Hey, listen, this is what's been happening with me and Kevin and gave a breakdown of, of pretty much what I'd been going through. And I was like, I'm really, really sorry. Um, and if you still want to be friends, we can still be friends. And li- I, I started to do that again. Now, obviously, he would try and log in and realize that I've changed my passwords. And um, I, one time he confronted me about it. And I was like, yeah, okay, what about Mary and Catherine and this one and that one? And he was just like, oh, you know, you know, those are just, I'm just talking. It's not even serious. And I was like, I- I've never even done what you're saying the the talking to justify the insecurities that you've had for so long and that you've held me hostage to for so long and now i've logged into your your inbox and i've seen things that have shaken me because i never expected this holier than thou righteous human being who would admonish me for the slightest thing to be the one with all these indiscretions. I just, to today, it blows my mind. Blows my mind. Um, so yeah, so I was like, nah, 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 nah. I'm done with this whole you checking my password thing. And by the way, I'm back friends with everybody that you um, uh, estranged me from. And I'm not going to hear anything about it because I've never given you a reason to doubt me. I've never stepped out of this relationship. And I'm, you know, and so we would make up, break up. At that point, I think we broke up because I was so fed, I was so fed up. So we broke up and I went to live with a friend. And um, I don't know how, but he got this friend to give him the key to the house of where I was living in. And I came back from, from uni and found my bed covered in chocolates and teddy bears. And again... We get back together because the love bombing, I guess, always won. Um, so I'm just like, okay, I guess this is true love. True love is tumultuous and you you go through these things, you you break up, you make up, and he's done this, these wild gestures. Whoever it is that I've moved in with and I've told them I'm fed up with Kevin has now told me, wow, look at all these chocolates on your bed. Look at all these. So again, who am I to then say, but actually... This is so wrong. And I don't even know. I don't even know the language to use to describe what I'm I'm going through with Kevin. All I know is he's my compass because he's all I know in terms of love, uh, romantic love. Um, He's the one serious relationship I have. So I I can't even compare him to any other person and say, but this other ex of mine treated me differently. Or, you know, he's, and he's using the fact that we've, already had sex to to basically say now we're tied for it we're tied forever so um yeah so our relationship uh progressed in that way ups and downs ups and downs more downs way more downs than ups um i don't remember being consistently happy for even a week 
during that period uh the fights would would literally at this point be about anything now the worst ever fight we had was the one that got physical because again i think i i don't know what i was confronting him about um and then he smashed my head into the hinge of a door and i started to bleed now we're in a house where we share a uh, a house with um we were sharing at the time with another couple and a single girl and now when you share a house with people obviously when you when you have you're bleeding and now you have to go and get stitches you have to explain to people why why you have stitches on your face now obviously they would have heard us fighting but still i couldn't get myself to say the truth so i was just like yeah no nah, i just hit myself you know you know how clumsy i am like i, I already had a reputation of being clumsy i've always been clumsy so like yeah, yeah you know how clumsy i am i just you know i just hit myself and i could see them being like mm. really we know but i wasn't about to i wasn't about to out him even to the even to the the doctor who tended to me i, I wasn't about to, to out, because i'm thinking oh my god oh my god if i say the truth he might be deported i might ruin his life i can't do this to me. this this is my my true love we're going to end up together anyway so still protected him um up until i think another really really bad fight happened and i could see him physically almost charging at me and something switched in me and i was like you can't you this is not this is not smart like this is actually stupid what you're doing protecting someone who would physically harm you so i snuck out of the house and went to the police station walked to the police station that was down the street walked there and um told them on this day at this time this kevin hit me um and or rather smashed my head against a whatever a door hinge i went to the hospital i got stitches but i didn't tell anyone what really happened and i'm only reporting this in case it happens again i don't want to press charges mm-hmm. at this point i don't want you to <laughs> confront him i don't want him to know i'm here but i want you to know just in case it happens again see now at this point my mind is still it's not it's still not at leave leave forever it's it's at i'll be with him but maybe it might happen again but i can you know I, i i can tell you at this point i'm pretty much the walking dead because you think about yourself and you're like me me someone hit me and i'm still with them so i make the report i leave uh the police station and they they assure me that you know we're not going to contact him we're not going to you know uh, press any charges uh but if it happens again there's a history He was like okay perfect. And then I was like you're not going to deport him. No, no, we're not going to deport him. Okay, cool. So, I've done that. I feel silently secure because I'm like okay, okay, if anything happens, you know? If anything happens, at least whoever it is will know. My family will know. I made a report. Someone will know. That's how I was feeling at the time. Just a walking dead. So, Melody, what would you say was like one of your lowest points in this relationship or one of the worst things that happened to you with uh, your relationship with Kevin the worst i remember was when i half my face got paralyzed um and i went to the doctors i mean i <laughs> i woke up right and i'm brushing my teeth and from one side of the fi- of my face the toothpaste is is falling out of my mouth because that part of my mouth is not working so i'm thinking i this hangover is very different because the night before I'd been out um so i'm just like okay cool i brush my teeth still this part the, the one side of my mouth is still spilling the toothpaste and the water but i'm just like again i i have no idea what's going on i don't feel any pain i don't feel any different but then i i look at myself in the mirror and i notice one of my eyes is looks bigger than the other or rather what i didn't know at the time is that that this that eye on that side of the face the same fa- the same side where my lip is kind of dead the eyelids weren't shutting but at the time i'm not realizing that's why my eye looks bigger it's just looking bigger so i'm just like ah i'm going to go back to bed and see if i can sleep this off i go back to bed and then i can't shut my eye that eye that is looking bigger can't shut to sleep so i'm thinking ah this is weird so i i i think i i nodded off and then woke up again then I, i went back to the mirror and then i think i tried to talk to the mirror and then i see my face drooping on one side oh my god and so i'm like oh my gosh what is this so i go to the doctors 
and the doctors uh you know they do a couple of tests and then they they tell me actually you've lost um uh the you've lost the motor functions on one half of your face and you've got a condition called bell's palsy and bell's palsy is either caused by some uh unknown like some really uh ex- I don't know call it exotic but some really uh, weird parasite or stress. And so they're like, "Oh, have you traveled to this place or this place or this place where the parasite is?" And I'm like, "No." And they're like, "Well, yours is stress related and we're sorry, there's no cure." And I was like, "What do you mean there's no cure?" And they're like, "The only cure that exists is in China." Um but in you know, right now there's no cure. So I was like, "So what do I do?" And they're like, "Well, you can buy a patch." people who get that condition your eye won't shut so you need to buy a patch so you can be covering your eye oh my god and gosh. um so because when you're sleeping your eye will be your eyelids will be open so something can fly in your eye you can get dust you can get dirt in your eye so <laughs> you need to I'm buy. sorry I don't mean to laugh but <laughs> what <laughs> so you need to buy a patch to cover your eye you know and why I'm laughing I'm sorry but I'm yeah. just laughing because like that's the solution <laughs> yeah to uh, your yeah, paralyzed. yeah buy a patch yeah buy an eye patch and and I was like ah oh, okay I can't say it really hit me up until um I'm going through life and people are talking to me and having that reaction that you just had people are laughing my friends are laughing cuz they're like why are you talk cuz I'm like talking like this mm. because one side of my mouth is drooping my eye can't shut so I'm not blinking so this eye is forever open and now I have to buy a patch so I go to a chemist to buy a patch uh and then I'm I'm like okay so this condi- I have to stay like this forever Um and the doctors did they say that this is forever? Yeah, they they basically said there's no cure. And it's no the, cure. still dating. And at Kevin, this time at the time when the, you're, the are you are you, is it my hitting stress, you? Kevin. Yeah, <sighs> is it hitting you that this is I mean, let me tell you as much as it's stressing me that my face looks fucking crazy. Kevin and I went to a concert that night and uh, we had photos of me looking lopsided at that concert still. Like When I tell you I was numb from pain from anguish from heart, heartbreak from I, I was just numb 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 in fact it, that's how even my face became half numb I was numb so um yeah so I I, I get told to wear this patch um I wear it now as a person as a, my personality is one to laugh a lot so I decided from that day I need to reduce my laughing because my laughing would cause my lopsidedness to be more apparent mm-hmm. So I was like now I have to take photos like those people who take sexy photos without smiling. And then um yeah, and then I remember just going on online and looking 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 up the condition and and looking up natural remedies because I remember thinking well the doctor has told me there's no cure meaning western medicine can't help me. So I went and looked for natural remedies and I saw um all this information about you know if your nerves are dead that's what causes that you know the stress can cause your nerves in your brain to to sort of sleep. And so now you need to stimulate the nerves and so they recommended all these things which I tried you know um I'm not a doctor so I'm not going to go into them in detail but um yeah they recommended all these remedies which I tried and I eventually after a few weeks I literally got my face back and then um yeah uh we continued with the relationship now his indiscretions became they they were not just in the online space he he was actually actively um uh i don't know if you would say pursuing pursuing um other women um and i i discovered this through uh you know intuition of him you know maybe getting a call and leaving the room or getting a message and turning away from me when i got a message those are things small small things like that made me wonder why are you changing the way that you behave around me when your phone rings or why is your phone ringing at 2 in the morning why is someone calling you at 2 in the morning like just things like that that didn't make sense and then i realized oh that he's actually cheating it's not just the emails i found he's actually cheating on me and now at this point <laughs> i don't even know i'm so numb from all the things i've been through that even the cheating doesn't have the magnitude that it should i mean cheating is it's heartbreaking but already my heart has been broken progressively for so long he's he's hit me he's abused me he's controlling he is just even at one point very um uh financially with hope because i remember at one point i wasn't working much and so he would control the things that i can buy the things that i can't 
by things like that. So I'm just like, my heart has progressively broken. So I'm almost in a numb state of, like I'm just, I call it walking dead because I'm alive, but I'm, I'm literally just inhaling and exhaling. There's no excitement I'm deriving from life. I used to wake up and ask God every single morning, why did you wake me up today? Wow. Why did I wake up today? J- to go through this again? Okay, cool. Let's go through the motions. And I would go through the motions. And the breaking point for me was when he slept with a girl who <laughs> had caused my family so much grief because she had come to Ke- she she was a, a a caucasian girl and she had come to kenya on holiday and i had hosted her at home and she ended up uh being obsessed with my brother and you know threatening suicide if he didn't break up with his girlfriend at the time to be with her things like that like she had caused my family so much grief she had um tried to like to physically attack my mom she had like she she literally she had literally been this whirlwind of a of of a holiday where my mom was like where did you find this human being i was doing a favor for a friend by her staying over at ours not knowing i've invited the devil <laughs> to our home so anyway she would she would leave love notes on my dad's car thinking it's my brother's car like it, it, like just psycho behavior Anyway, at this time, obviously, because I'm with Kevin, he knows what, what's going on. He knows all these things that she's putting us through. And so because I'm with Kevin, he, can, he knows what's happening. And then when this girl comes back to, to where we were overseas, he sleeps with her. And for me, that was, I remember almost going blind from rage. That night, I'm not a smoker. I went out and bought cigarettes because I was just like, I need, I need something. I need something out of the ordinary to get me out of the physical state. I was f- like what I was feeling, because again, I'm not, phys- I'm not verbally argumentative. I'm not a big drinker. I tried to, I tried and I'm just like, I need, so I go and buy cigarettes and I'm like, okay, maybe smoking, smoking. People who smoke look <laughs> calm. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, I'm going to smoke many and then maybe I'll feel calm. So I try and I choke and I cough and I'm just like, what the fuck? Like, what, what am I going to do? What am I going to do to feel, to remove whatever pain I'm feeling? There's nothing that's working. So I leave, obviously at that point I've left the house. I'd gone to sleep over at a friend's house. Now this person who I thought was a friend, um uh i then realized later had told had gone to this the girl who had stalked my brother the caucasian girl she had gone to her and said oh do you know she was complaining that kevin hit her like me if kevin hit me and he did all the things he used to do for her i would have stayed with him this is someone i considered a very close friend Mm -hmm. so she's telling all of this to this caucasian girl and she's like, um, so this uh, Caucasian girl is like, oh, so you, so they're not okay. She's like, nah. She's like, yeah, you should even you should even pursue him, kind of thing. So this is this is someone who I'm not even aware is is talking like this behind my back. That's the person I run to when things mm. have gone so left with Kevin. So I run to her, stay over at her house, and then the Caucasian girl finds out I'm there and comes and she's like, oh, by the way. She's the one who told me, oh, blah, 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 blah. and again, my heart is broken afresh. And I'm like, so what you're telling me is I have nowhere to go. What you're telling me is I have nobody. And I'm just, I'm in a phase of, I, I don't even know. At that point, I, I, quit, I quit uni. I quit, because um, Kevin and I were in the same, were studying the same course. I was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to see you. It, there's no way I can lay eyes on you again. I just will not be able to live. I wanted to kill myself. I, I just did not want to live anymore. So I, I remember as well trying to, trying to swallow a bunch of Panadols, probably a handful, but I didn't get, I didn't get five. I probably swallowed four or five. Like I, I, I wanted to numb myself or kill my, like I just, I remember thinking I want to stand in front of a truck so it can hit me. So I can go into a coma, but I don't want to be brain dead and I don't want to die, but I don't want to be alive. Mm-hmm. I just want to, I just want to not be awake for a while, a long time. And then I was like, okay, but you can't control the speed of the truck. So you can't control the speed at which it hits you. So now, what, you know, like those, those things now start playing in your brain. Then I was like, okay, so maybe I should just go to the train tracks and then just bump into the train when it comes. Like 
the things you think about to try and numb your pain. So I, yeah, I remember trying to swallow a bunch of Panadols. Then I was like, okay, this thing, I can't go through with the suicide, suicide thing. So, um, so I was like, okay, let me quit uni. I quit uni, didn't enroll. Again, my parents are like, why haven't you asked us for fees? I'm like, me, yeah, I've quit uni, by the way. Um, and because I haven't, you know, I, I can't even tell them the gravity of what I'm going through because I'm thinking, they're going to think I'm so stupid. Like, they don't know their daughter to be stupid. So now, who is this person? I'm, who's, who's this going to them with all these stories? I couldn't talk to them. I couldn't talk to my friends because I, I think it, it got to a point they were so fed up with... Sto- this is my friends in Kenya. They were so fed up with email after email of, you know, <laughs> horror stories, basically, about Kevin. And now I've gone back to him, and now we're broken up. And I've gone back to him, but now it's really bad. Now we're broken up for real. But then I've gone back to him again. Do you understand? Like, mm-hmm. people were tired of hearing my stories. So... Um, I quit uni and um, I'm just basically inhaling and exhaling every day. And um, now as, as someone, if, you, if you've gone overseas on a, on a student visa, if you don't fulfill the requirements of your student visa, you get deported. And so I, I, was, I got the first threat, the first um, email threat from the uni being like, you haven't enrolled, um, it's our duty to tell immigration. And then I, I was like, I didn't even reply. Like, you know, when you just, I don't know if, you, if, if you've ever been in a place in your life where no consequence, nothing feels as grave as what you're going through personally. I was like, so then, if you're going, you know, at this point, my dad has given me all the threats you can think of. You're no longer my child. If you've quit uni, I'm like, cool, fine. Uni has told me we'll deport you. I'm like, cool, tell immigration, fine. Like me, my work is to inhale and exhale. I can't do anything beyond that. So I get, um, you know, a call from someone from, you know, the International Student Center, a caller, uh, you know, one of my guardian angels. She doesn't know me, but just has just decided, something has just decided to tell her to call me. So she calls me. She's like, can I, can I talk to you? And I go into her office and she's like, what's happening? And I break down for the first time in I don't even know how long. I break down into tears and I tell her everything that has happened to me and she goes I'm not going to tell immigration Uh, I'm actually putting my job on the line because I'm supposed to tell immigration when a student hasn't enrolled because that triggers them to then cancel your visa and send you back home and so I'm not going to tell immigration but I'm begging you do not do anything illegal for the next six months I'm giving you six months that's all I can give you at that point I still don't care like I'm hearing what she's saying, but I'm still, I'm not, I don't think, oh, thank you so much. You've done me such a huge favor. I'm not thinking that. I'm I'm just thinking I'm broke, so I don't even have a ticket to go home. So even your threats, whatever threat you get, I don't even know how to process it because I'm so broke. I don't, I don't. I don't have any will to live. I have no will to study, obviously. I have no will to look after myself. What is deportation? So... One of my really good friends, again, another guardian angel, told me uh, the first step for you to rebuild your life is to leave, as, uh, to stop living with Kevin and like start your own life. And, um, and he was like, I'll, act, I'll pay the bond. I'll, 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 we'll, we'll look for a house. I'll pay the bond. I'll pay whatever it is that you need to pay right now that you don't have money for and you can pay me back later. But you need to leave. Mm. Again, I'm like, cool do whatever you're going to do. I'm not really invested in any process. So this friend of mine gets a house. Um, We move in together. There's three of us. And every, every week or so I'd find a bus ticket on my pillow. I'd find this, I'd find food I'd you know, just little, little things, little gestures of grace, just absolute grace for someone who at the time was basically the walking dead. Slowly by slowly people started to, yank me out of my my depressive existence and i remember even my 23rd birthday a bunch of friends came to 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 the house with gifts and found me crying in my room because i'm just i was like what kind of what kind of life is what kind of birthday is this what kind of i'm so used to now the love bombing i'd experienced for the last (laughs) however many years now i'm in my room by myself crying my eyes out i miss my family so much i miss myself but i don't even know how to get back to myself let alone um (laughs) 
how to even explain how what I'm going through. They come, they find me crying, and literally within minutes get the buy tickets to 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 interstate. We go interstate, and they're just like, let's just let's go to the club. Okay, I think even at one point, the, uh, a friend was dressing me physically, dressing me to go out to the club because I'm so numb to everyday life that I don't even care. I don't care. Like I do, I could go in my pajama. Like I just the 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 ability to care about life was was gone. So just progressive steps like that and then you know uh, eventually uh within that six month six month period um I decided to then re-enroll in uni and then get my life back on track. So um yeah so I just remember thinking okay I need to get over this guy I need to get over this guy I need to get over this guy I'll do anything to get over this guy and for me that meant the first available person I will sleep with to rid myself of the memory of Kevin. And so I started on that journey of being like I need to <laughs> immediately because at that point you have to really, I you know I had lost my virginity to Kevin. I'd never been with anybody else and um couldn't even fathom the idea of random sex or casual sex and still had so much <laughs> indoctrination and ideology in my head about but we're meant to end up together you can't be with anybody else so i was still holding up my end of the bargain whether or not we were together and i think i i think it got to a point where i was like mm nah he's he's like at this point slept with how many like see he's now sleeping with 25 people at the same time and like in my head i was just like why are you acting loyal for someone who doesn't even care yeah so I remember going on this trajectory of being like I will do everything to get over him every, regardless of what it means about my personal morals. I will do anything to get over him. And so, yeah, slowly by slowly I started to live a life that was, you know, quite separate from him and the gap in uni of, of six months meant that, you know, now he's advanced and I think at that point had even graduated. So it meant I didn't see him in uni either, which was also a saving grace for me because I just, I needed to be rid of him in every area of my life. And so slowly by slowly, I started to rebuild slowly by slowly. I started to consume material about, um, uh self worth and self affirming uh, how to affirm myself and that kind of thing and um you know even myself being accountable for the things that i accepted in that relationship myself being accountable for my lacking communication skills because you know i i was very i still am very very um bad with communication especially when i'm upset I tend to just withdraw. I'll just emotionally withdraw, physically, you know, verbally deal with it in my brain and then kind of move on. But what that has done is that it's just buried it. And so if this person aggravates me again and again and again and again, it just the wound keeps getting bigger. It's just that I'm not talking about it. It'll show, it'll manifest in another way. So um yeah, so I started to live a life separate from from Kevin and then I I ended up getting such a great support system around me um who are my inner circle to this day and uh yeah just slowly started to now reveal to my parents guys this is what was going on at this time and they're like what a boy <laughs> you quit uni because of a boy <laughs> like I think you know up until today and I don't blame them they're, they're a different generation but up until today they're just I don't think they they understand fully how it's possible that somebody's son um had such a negative impact on me to the point where I forgot myself to that extent. So yeah, so slowly I started to rebuild my life and you know um eventually eventually after so much self <laughs> self evaluation self work was able to get over kevin to the point where now i could see him and not feel physical triggered reactions you know like you know when you see someone like that you've spent so long with and for instance you see them with somebody else you feel physically ill i remember the first time i saw him with someone he was dating i felt physically sick mm-hmm. because he's the only one i've ever known physically you know and so i'm just like hi yeah he can move on so you you can move on like this and not only can you move on you've already you've already done all these other things you were doing with all these other women so i think that was just the biggest wake up call for me in terms of 
you can be so loyal you can want so much from a relationship you can give your entire being to somebody and it's still not enough for them to uh either treat you right or for to to deal with their demons because he he had a whole fucking suitcase container of demons that he hadn't dealt with and you know and i had my own my own um demons that i hadn't dealt with so you bring t- those two people together it's just bound to be a disaster and at 16 17 honestly speaking you have i when i look back and i when i have conversations with my 17 year old self i'm like you had no business dating this seriously this young no business be stressed about your talent at 17 be stressed about your violin lessons and whether you know key a or key d you don't need to be stressing about another human being mm. at that age and it's something that whenever i say for instance my younger cousins or whenever i encounter someone that age who's having issues with someone they're dating i'm just like listen uh, you, let me tell you my story and maybe maybe then you can understand why i can tell you you don't need to be stressing about another human being at this age because now i'm in my almost my mid 30s and i'm just like <laughs> I can't, no, I can't recognize who that 17-year-old was because right now not even a fraction of that can I stand. Not even a, fr- a fraction of that dysfunction can I be able to put up with. But at that age I put up with things that even I don't even know people who've lived a lifetime um sometimes don't experience. So yeah, that's uh in a nutshell, long story long. Long story <laughs> long. <laughs> I was going to ask you yeah. oh, how what your takeaway what your takeaway was from all these lessons from the breakdown but I mm. think you've already answered that mm. and um um I don't know if it's even fitting mm. for me to ask if you think you mm. contributed to the breakdown of this relationship mm. because it feels like a very abusive mm. relationship so yeah. maybe you can just I mean talk in about hindsight that. what I feel like uh I contributed in terms of my own detriment is ignoring red flags You see, I can't blame anybody. No, he Kevin didn't have a gun to my head. Um yes, he was controlling and all these things, but it, at the end of the day, the responsibility to leave is on me. Um and that is something that I had to reconcile because I used to think, well, he should have done this, he should have changed, he should have been nicer. No, no, no. You should have left. You should have left. And you should have left and done a clean cut break gone like sometimes i feel like i wish i never went overseas but you know now I, there's so many benefits the benefits of uh, and beautiful things that arose out of my going overseas and and following him there but the responsibility at the end of the day the choice was with me i should have left so the things that i feel like i'm accountable for other than you know obviously the lack of communication not being able to stand up for myself is i should have paid attention to the first red flag and i should have honored my intuition when my intuition told me yo there's some messed up shit going on here melody where are you now oh man now now i'm in such a just a different space mentally romantically um right now i'm engaged traditionally married uh but you know western in the western world engaged to my fiance and um we're expecting a baby um so yeah Congratulations. i mean thank you so yeah it, i mean it's 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 been what i would say a very um like even recounting this story has taken me back to just a place of of being like wow wow mm. how things can change but you know never never let go of the idea that you know your story can actually change your story is not what your is happening to you right now you can actually flip the page and be like uh uh-uh. uh and right now I'm with a partner who I actively choose every day because he is beyond wonderful so um yeah very very happy with with how life has turned out now he's a good guy yeah, yeah he's a great guy <laughs> and that's melody's story i want to thank her so much for sharing with us today and allowing her story to connect with all of us listening to this podcast i think we can all relate to something there if there is one thing i must say i admire in us in humans is the power to adapt to heal to learn and to move forward 
If you have liked this episode, please subscribe to this podcast and leave us a review. You can also share this podcast with a friend or two and follow us on our Instagram at so this is love underscore podcast. If you would like to be a part of this podcast, you can also reach us via direct message on our Instagram. This is Jules. See you next time.